So I apologize. I had a technical problem with the videos last night. They are OK. Uh, but I was hoping to post them last night. I couldn't get them posted. I've been busy all day in the Celebrating Undergraduate Excellence event, as I, as I said I would be. But I will get those posted. The, um, the lecture video from yesterday is going up there right now. It should be up there in just a little bit. Um, and the review session video will follow. Uh, it may not be till mid-evening before it makes it up there, but I will get that up there as quickly as I possibly can. Okay? I know you want to see those things. I will post the highlights as well. So um, my apologies for my being busy today, and, and um, I hope that everything is going well for you. As I said, I will be in my office all day tomorrow. So if you have questions you want to come ask, uh, please feel free to come and see me. OK? Yes? Um, I'm always in by 9. Um, and tomorrow, uh, my recollection is I've got a, actually, I have an 8.30 meeting that will last until close to 10. So I won't be in my office until 10, but I will be, uh, unless the meeting gets out early. Uh, yeah, OK. OK. So um, we have a little bit of material to cover. And it's not a lot of material, but there's, a, there's actually a fair amount of depth to this. Now, this, of course, is on the final exam. It's not on the exam uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I want to spend uh, some time going through this because I think if you understand this, you understand even more about how your body works and how your body responds to various situations that it finds itself in. So I'm going to spend some time talking about regulation. That's something that's going to be really important here, and that's going to be coming in down here. All right. Uh, the first things that I'll talk about when we talk about metabolic pathways involving glycogen these are the easiest pathways you will ever learn. Okay? I can assure you that the metabolic pathways for glycogen are the easiest ones you will ever learn. There's only a couple of enzymes that's even involved in both of them. So I'll show you what they are, and we'll see what glycogen looks like and why this is a consideration. But those pathways are very, very uh, straightforward. It's the regulation that's more complicated, and it's the regulation that is really where the interesting things are in, um, in uh, how glycogen uh, works in our body. Okay, So let's start with the structure of glycogen. So I talked about glycogen uh, earlier when I talked about carbohydrates that were polysaccharides in animals. All right. So polysaccharides in animals, glycogen is the primary carbohydrate that we find. And you may recall that it was a polymer of glucose that had alpha-1,4 bonds, and it had alpha-1,6 branches. And it had branches about once every 10 glucoses or so. That is, it had a 1,6 branch about every 10 glucoses. All right. Now, the result of that is what you see on the screen. Those are all branches of, glyco uh, of glycogen. So the original glycogen started, um, where did it start? It's not even visible on there. Should be a non-blue start. I don't see it on a non-blue start anywhere. Well, in any event, we have a, and here it is right here. There, there's, well, actually, yeah, no, that, that's a branch. I thought there was one on there, but I guess I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just colorblind. I don't know. I, I'm not colorblind. But in any event, um, um, Glycogen is, is, is this polymer. Now, glycogen, you may recall, differs from amylose. Amylose was just a polymer of alpha 1 4s. I said it was a plant polysaccharide. It's, amylose was one of the ways that plants store uh, glucose. And the other way that, ways that plants store glucose was a, a molecule that also had branches called amylopectin. And amylopectin, uh, instead of having branches about every 10 or so uh, glucoses, had branches about every 50. So they weren't nearly as branched. So you can imagine a tree that's got a lot of branches versus a tree that doesn't have as many branches. All right? That's really the analogy that we're making here. Versus amylose, which has only one you know, uh, thing, maybe a sunflower, no branches. It just goes up. Right? All right. Now, the reason I, I point this out is that branches really turn out to be very critical. I think I mentioned this in class before, but I want to underline this for you. If I didn't say it before, I will underline it here. Okay. And that is that the more branches that a polysaccharide has, the more glucose can be released quickly. We'll see why that's the case in a minute. Okay. The more branches a polysaccharide has, the more glucose 
can be released quickly, assuming, of course, it's a polymer of glucose. These, these all are that I'm talking about. All right. Now, well, why is that the case? Well, that's the case because the enzymes that break this down start at an end and work inwards. They start at an end and work inwards. Well, the more ends we have, the more places where enzymes can start to break that down and move inwards, and therefore, the more glucose can be released. If I have something that has few branches, it doesn't have as many ends, and not as much glucose can be released quickly. Well, this turns out to be really critical for animals because animals need quick energy. Animals, again, as we talked about before, they need to escape from predators, they need to run quickly, they have muscles that need to be fed, they need to be fed right now, not tomorrow, not an hour from now, not five minutes from now, but right now. And so they need to have an instantaneous source of energy. One of the instantaneous sources of energy is glycogen, which is found in the muscles. So when you get that predator chasing you, or you get scared or whatever, and your adrenaline is flowing, the adrenaline is favoring the, bla the, 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 breakdown, the breakdown of glycogen, and it's releasing a ton of glucose quickly. That's what's happening with adrenaline. Okay? That's what's happening with adrenaline. Okay. So again, plants don't have to escape from something. They can't escape from something. They don't have those big energy needs immediately. So they don't need something that's nearly as branched as glycogen is. And that's one of the reasons why plant uh, uh, polysaccharides are not as branched. OK. Well, that's where we start. Well, how do we break down glycogen? Okay. Glycogen is broken down in a rea reaction called a phosphorolysis. And I'll show you what that means in just a second, a phosphorolysis. What is a phosphorolysis? If I said a hydrolysis, what would you say was going on? Breaking with water. Very good. It's breaking up something using water. So a phosphorolysis is breaking up something using phosphorus. It's using phosphate specifically. Okay. Well, here's what happens. Okay. Here's a glucose that has all of these ends and so forth. All right. And here's a phosphate floating around in solution. And in the presence of an enzyme known as glycogen phosphorylase, and yes, that's an enzyme you definitely should know, glycogen phosphorylase, I'll spell it for you, P-H-O-S-P-H-O-R-Y-L-A-S-E. Glycogen phosphorylase catalyzes this reaction. So what's going on? Well, a phosphate is, is coming along, and it's it, it's, the enzyme is catalyzing the use of that phosphate to break a bond. And as a consequence of breaking that bond, the phosphate gets attached to glucose at position 1. So we make something called glucose 1-phosphate. All right? That's the product of that reaction. Okay. Well, why is this important? Well. When we started glycolysis, we started with a reaction that took glucose and it added a phosphate to it and made glucose 6-phosphate. Everybody remember that reaction? That was the hexokinase reaction. And what was needed to put that phosphate on? ATP, right? So we had to have ATP. We had to have high energy to put that phosphate onto glucose. Why don't we need high energy to put this phosphate onto glucose? to make glucose 1-phosphate. Why don't we need that ATP? What's that? The enzyme, so enzymes don't change anything about the energy. Enzymes only, OK, can make the reaction go faster. So it's not the enzyme. Very good, right over here, OK? Can it leverage the energy of popping off the glucose? That's another way of saying this bond that holds that glucose to the polymer has energy in it. And that's exactly the answer to the question. This polymer, each glucose being linked to one another, there's energy in there. There's energy in those bonds. And so this is using the energy of those bonds to put a phosphate on. Well, Kevin, why do you care about that? Well, I care about this for the same reason your cells care about this. 
the less ATP I have to use, the more ATP I have to do things. If I have to use ATP to put phosphate onto here, I've just wasted an ATP. I don't have to do it. This is using the energy of that bond to make that phosphate go on there. Yes, Julie. This is more efficient as a result. That's right. Okay. Now, this is also simpler. I don't need an ATP. I just all I have to have is a phosphate. And yes, there are, there is plenty of phosphate floating around cells. Did you have a question? Okay. So we're going to talk about how glycogen is made. It's a good question, but let me let me save that until I talk about synthesis. Yep. Yep. No problem. All right. So that's where we are. All right. So we've seen the breakdown of glycogen. Well, it's not quite that simple. There's, there's, there's a little bit more to it, and I'll show you a little bit more, but it's not very much more. All right? So this is how we break it down, the enzyme being glycogen phosphorylase. And it's glycogen phosphorylase we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. Okay. Well, once we've got glucose 1-phosphate, okay, it would be nice to be able to convert it into something that would be in glycolysis, right? because then we could burn it up. Well, the glycolysis intermediate is known as glucose 6-phosphate. And so we have an enzyme that will convert that from this into this. It's known as, and here's something that you may want to think about. It's called phosphoglucomutase. Phosphoglucomutase. What did I say about mutases? So what would be the intermediate you would expect to see in this guy if this were a mutase, which it is? A glucose 1,6-bisphosphate intermediate. Because it would put the phosphate on here first, and then it will pull the phosphate off of here. And that's exactly what it does. And yes, the glucose 1,6-bisphosphate intermediate is also stable. And yes, it is also released a little bit. It doesn't do anything. But that's uh, a stable intermediate that, that another mutase makes, like we saw with the 2,3-BPG. Okay? Now, that's what's happening here. Well, the beauty of this is we've gotten to glucose 6-phosphate without, putting, without burning an ATP. This guy is now ready to go through glycolysis and burn up. So now we see how the pathways start connecting with each other. We've broken down glycogen from the glycogen pathway and the intermediate from it is going to enter glycolysis. Okay? That's pretty simple. There's only one other consideration we have for the breakdown of glycogen. And it's due to a quirk that is part of the glycogen phosphorylase. So I'm going to show you that quirk. Right? The quirk is that glycogen phosphorylase is a finicky enzyme. If it weren't a finicky enzyme, you'd have one less thing to memorize. But it is a finicky enzyme. And the finickiness of it is that glycogen phosphorylase loves ends, but it doesn't want to get too close to a branch. It will only go to within four or five residues of a branch. There's a branch. We see in this case we've got four, and it's not going to chew in any closer than four residues away from that branch. Glycogen phosphorylase at this point has reached its limit. Okay. Well, if we had that limit, we wouldn't get very far with breaking down our glycogen because we've got all these glucoses that would be sitting here that the cell could use, but it's not using them because phosphorylase won't go any closer. Well, fortunately, we have another enzyme in our body that has a long name. It's about this long if you, if you write the whole thing out. Okay. We're not going to use that name. We're going to use a very simple name and a simple name that tells you what it does. The name that we're going to use is called debranching enzyme. It tells you what it does. It's debranching. And it's also an interesting enzyme. It works and it does two things. It actually has two activities that it catalyzes. Right? Now, one of these activities is it clips off that remaining three, and it moves them down to the next chain. So it's converted. This is an alpha 1,4 bond right here. The only place where we have 1,6 is where the branch is. Then everything after it is 1,4 again. So it's taking this alpha 1,4 bond, and it's converting it down here and making another alpha 1,4 bond. 
Well, why did it leave one behind? Okay. Well, the one it left behind, it clips off in a separate reaction, and instead of putting a phosphate onto it, it, put, it cleaves it with water. It does a hydrolysis. Now, that seems kind of odd. Isn't that less efficient, Kevin, you might ask? And I would say, well, yes and no. My question to you is, why would I say no? Why does this enzyme cut it off with water, whereas glycogen phosphorylase used a phosphate? There's a very good reason why. I will give two points of extra credit to the first person who has it. What do you have? There's a water that's involved, but it's still not a hydrolysis reaction. Uh, available hydroxyl on? No, no. So that, that, that hydroxyl will be there. Yes? Does it have to do with the charge of the phosphate interacting with the oxygen? The charge of the phosphate interacting with the oxygen? No, no, not quite either. This is a tough one. You get, maybe I should give three points for this one. But you actually can figure this one out. No? I bet you could. Yes? It's not the stereochemistry. Nice, nice, nice try. But stereochemistry might get at the problem. But it's not, the answer is not stereochemistry. You may tell, I'll get a few more guesses. Okay. There's plenty of water available, but that's not the answer either. Yep. On, the le on, on my left. There's not stereochemistry with phosphate. Well, the mechanism does require water, but, but my question is, why is it water and not phosphate? You're probably not going to get it. Well, it is a different bond, but people don't want to let those points go. I can see this. <laughs> what did you say? OK, so she, she's got the answer. All right? The answer is that a 1,6 bond doesn't have as much energy as a 1,4 bond does. A 1,6 bond doesn't have as much energy. And this is a pure demonstration of it right here. The reason this can't use a phosphate is if it used a phosphate, it wouldn't be able to put it on because there's not enough energy released in a 1,6 to make that happen. Very good. That's a tough one. OK? Makes sense? OK. So. As a consequence, this guy is the only one that's broken off in glycogen breakdown where there's free glucose released. There's no other reaction where free glucose is released because everything else l releases glucose 1-phosphate. Okay. Well, wh what's going to happen to that glucose? It's going to go to glycolysis. And what's going to happen in glycolysis? Well, it's going to have to first use an ATP. Right? That's why this is less efficient, but it's less efficient because there's not enough energy in that bond to put a phosphate on. OK, very good. Now, um, somebody mentioned synthesis. Let's, th that's all you need to know for, for breakdown. So you got, I talked about three enzymes. I talked about glycogen phosphorylase. I talked about phosphoglucomutase. And I talked about uh, debranching enzyme. With those three enzymes, you can completely break glycogen down to glucose. Yes? Can a person ever break down all their glycogen? They can't. They don't typically, but they can. Yep. Starting a glycogen from scratch, um, you don't need to know this, but I'll just tell you, starting a glycogen from scratch is a bit of a pain. You can't just use the synthesis enzymes I'm going to talk about here, but you have to have a special enzyme called glycogenin, which is how you start a, a glycogen uh, overall. But you don't need to know that. All right, let's talk about synthesis. Synthesis is very simple also. There's one little hook in synthesis. The little hook in synthesis is that we can't just simply do the reversal of the breakdown. For the same reasons, we couldn't do the simple reversal of the pyruvate kinase reaction. It takes too much energy to do the simple reversal. So we have to do a little two-step. And the little two-step that we do starts with synthesis of this guy. Okay. 
I can't take glucose 1-phosphate and join it to another glucose and make the beginnings of glycogen or even add it to an existing glycogen chain because there's not enough energy for me to do that. Instead, the cells use something we call an activated intermediate. The activated intermediate is this guy right here. It's called UDP glucose, or uridine diphosphate glucose. You, you can call it UDPG or UDP glucose. Okay? Now, what do I mean by an activated intermediate? We see these happen in metabolism sometimes, that an activated intermediate is a high energy molecule that uses part of its energy to transfer a part of itself to something else. So a, a, a high, an activated intermediate is a high energy molecule that uses a part of its energy to attach a part of itself to something else. It does. So what's going to happen in this process is this glucose right here is going to be attached to a growing glycogen chain. It's going to make an alpha-1-4 bond. Well, how do we make this in the first place? All right. Well, we started with glucose 1-phosphate and UTP. UTP is a triphosphate. Triphosphate has the same energy as ATP. That's how we made it. So glucose 1-phosphate plus UTP made this guy. And no, I'm not going to ask you to know the na name of the enzyme for that because it's really got a name that's long. Okay? So consequently, we're going to burn a UTP to make this, and then we're going to use this to add a glucose to a growing glycogen chain. All right. Well, what enzyme takes this and adds the glucose to a growing glycogen chain? That's the next enzyme here, and it's a very important enzyme known as glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase. So we have glycogen phosphorylase that breaks it down, and we have glycogen synthase that synthesizes it. Okay? Well, what does it do? Here's UDP glucose. Here's a glycogen chain. And now here's a glycogen chain that has grown by one residue. And yes, it put it on in the alpha 1, 4 configuration. So it just created an alpha 1, 4 bond. This tells us that it takes energy to make that alpha 1, 4 bond. You can see the energy it took. It took, ultimately, a triphosphate from UTP. OK. Now, we're almost there. There's only one other thing we have to do to make glycogen, and that is we have to use another enzyme whose name is this long. Glycogen is very well known for having enzyme names that are this long. But we're going to call this enzyme branching enzyme. And so what's branching enzyme going to do? Well, about every 10 residues, it's going to come and it's going to clip off a part of it and it's going to make another alpha 1, 6 branch. That's what it's going to do. Why doesn't this reaction require any, any ATP energy to do this? To put those glucoses on, to make alpha 1, 4 bonds, I had to put energy on. Why don't I have to do it to make a 1, 6? The 1, 6 bond has less energy. So there's enough energy released in the breaking of a 1,4 to make a 1,6 branch. Very good. OK? Clear as mud? Yes, sir? That's just arbitrary where they put it on there. On average, they're about 10. Yeah. They, if they did 10, I think they had to make a bigger figure. Or I shouldn't say they. I actually had a student make it. but So blame me. But anyway, uh, that's, but the, uh, on average, they would be about 10. OK, so we have now broken down glycogen, and we've now made glycogen. All right? And that's all there is to it. You might say, well, hey, Kevin, what about that glucose 1-phosphate? Where do we get the glucose 1-phosphate to make the UDPG? And I would ask you that question on an exam. I'd say, well, where did you make that? Where, did, where, where would you get that from? Would it be just coming from breaking down glycogen? Well, not really because I'd just be simply running the reaction backwards. I'd be doing a vicious cycle, right? 
break down, make, break down, make, break down, make. If I'm not doing that, then where does the glucose 1-phosphate come from? Any thoughts? What's that? Glycolysis doesn't have glucose 1-phosphate. What's that? Phosphoglucomutase catalyzes a reversible reaction. All right? So just like we can go from glucose 6 phosphate to glucose 1 phosphate, so too can we go from glucose I'm sorry, from glucose 1 to 6, so too can we go from glucose 6 to 1. <coughs> because it's a reversible reaction. That's all there is to it. So, the breakdown and the synthesis of glycogen is as I said one of the easiest metabolic pathways you will ever learn because there's only a few enzymes that are involved. The real magic of glu glycogen metabolism is not in its breakdown and in its synthesis, but rather it's in how that's controlled. And you're going to listen, oh my God, I heard somebody go, geez, yeah, all right. Look at that thing. And we've seen this figure before, and now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. I'm going to try to keep it at a simple level, but there's some things in here that you need to understand to understand how your body works, okay? All right. So. Let's try to simplify what looks like a complicated figure. All right? When I said, when I talked about pyruvate kinase, I said it was regulated in two ways yesterday. Anybody remember what those two ways were? So you're talking about AMP was one of the things, but what was, what's the type of regulation that that is? Allosteric regulation. And what's the other type of regulation? Covalent modification. Glycogen phosphorylase is regulated in both ways also. It's regulated allosterically, and it's regulated by covalent modification. This figure is showing you both of those things. It's showing you both of these things. Now, I'm going to step you through it sequentially, because I want you to understand this figure. If you guys understand this figure, you will be as good as any biochemist around. I'm very serious about that. I was talking to a major in biochemistry today who doesn't take my class. They take a different class. They take a class for majors. They weren't familiar with this because their teacher hadn't gone through it with them. Now, I'm going through it with you to show you how your body works. I want you to understand how your body works, okay? All right. Up and down. When I go up and down, I am talking about allosteric regulation. And when I'm going left and right, I'm talking about covalent modification. All right? Up and down, allosteric, left and right, covalent modification. All right? Let's talk about covalent modification first because that's probably the easiest to understand. All right? We see that up here I've got a T form, and I've got a T form. I've got an R form, and I've got an R form. All right? If I take this T form and I put phosphates onto it, I still have a T form but it's more active. If I take this R form and I put, a, uh, put phosphates on it, I get an R form with phosphates and it's more active. As I put phosphates onto any of these forms, they get more active, meaning that they will really jump in and start breaking things down. Will a T form with phosphate be more active than an R form or less active? T forms will in general be less active, and that is definitely the case here. This is more active than this is, but it's not as active as this is. Okay? The R form without the phosphate will not be as active as this form is. And no, we're not going to compare these two to say which one's higher. All right? Our life is complicated enough as it is. All right? So, Putting phosphate on goes to the right. Taking phosphate off goes to the left. What's the general name of enzymes that we talk about that put phosphates onto things? Kinases. This is a kinase. Phosphorylase kinase puts phosphate onto a phosphorylase. And look, there's the phosphorylase. This is actually a dimer. That's why you see two phosphates, one for each unit. But that doesn't really matter. Okay. 
Here's the same enzyme, phosphorylase kinase. It doesn't matter if it's in the R state or in the T state, the kinase puts the phosphate on. Well, things that take phosphates off of molecules are known as phosphatases. And here's a phosphatase known as phosphoprotein phosphatase that takes it off. Okay? That's all there is to it. Phosphate on, phosphate off. All right? Yes, sir. Boy, there's a very good question right there. Okay. Phosphorylase kinase is, in fact, specific for uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And phosphoprotein phosphatase is a general phosphatase that will take phosphates off of a lot of different proteins. Very good question. You're anticipating something that I'll talk about with respect to glycogen synthase in just a little bit. Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to talk about allosteric regulation, and then I'm going to come back and talk about this phosphate, because the really interesting things in this enzyme are not the allosteric, but rather the phosphates. That's really where this enzyme gets interesting. Okay? But let's, let's talk about the allosterism before that. Okay? Let's imagine I've got an enzyme sitting around in the T state. Okay? So I've got glycogen phosphorylase, it's in the T state, and it's got no phosphates on it. All right? When might that happen? Well, if I'm sitting around watching the tube, drinking beer and eating pizza, not getting much exercise, I, my muscles aren't doing anything but lifting each of those pieces of pizza or bottles of beer. All right? Not getting much exercise, there's no reason for me to be breaking down my glycogen because I don't need that. All right. How will I get it up here? All right. Well, if I'm sitting around watching the tube, eating pizza, drinking beer, and I had any of this guy in the R state, it would get converted into the T state because my ATP levels are going to be high. My ATP levels are high because I'm not burning it up. And so I'm going to convert this guy from the R state, where it's going to be somewhat active, into the T state with no phosphates, where it's not going to be active. Glucose 6-phosphate is also an indicator of high energy, for reasons I won't talk about here, but it is. Okay? So high energy is turning this enzyme completely off because, hey, stupid, there's no reason to be lighting the furnace in the middle of the summer. There's no reason to be burning up your glycogen because you're not going to need it when you're sitting around drinking beer, watching the tube, and eating pizza. Let's imagine that my alarm goes off, my fire alarm goes off as I am sitting there drinking beer, watching the tube, and eating pizza. All of a sudden, I got to get up and I got to get out of there, or at least I've got to go and turn the fire alarm off because maybe I left the oven on and the smoke is going on. Okay? And some, for some reason, I've got to exert some energy. Well, I'm going to assume it's the worst case. I'm going to say my house is on fire. All right? Well, I'm scared. Okay? My adrenaline is going to flow, but it takes my adrenaline a little while to make a difference. Adrenaline will take a few seconds to do something. But I've got to get out of here now. I've got to get up. I've got to run. And maybe I've got a giant house, and I have to run a long ways to get outside my house in my dreams, I suppose, right? Okay? I've got to run a long ways to get out of that house. Well, once I take a few steps, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my ATP levels? Right? Very quickly, my ATP levels are going to fall. What's going to happen to my glucose levels? Same thing. They're going to fall very, very quickly, right? Okay? Well, all of a sudden, I need energy. All of a sudden, I need glucose. If I'm waiting for adrenaline, which we'll talk about in a second, if I'm waiting for adrenaline to help get me some glucose, I'm going to have to stop and wait. I can't afford to stop and wait. I need an immediate source. So what's going to happen immediately? Well, my ATP levels start falling. When they start falling, I start burning ADP to keep the energy going. And when I burn ADP, what do I get? AMP. And when I make AMP, look what happens. 
as my energy levels are falling precipitously low, precipitously low, I'm not sure that's appropriate, but, but when they're falling very low, all right, what's happening is I'm converting this guy into the R state, and what's it going to do in the R state? It's going to start to break down glycogen. And when it starts breaking down glycogen, my glucose levels start to rise. This is happening in my muscle cells. This is not Cori cycle. This is happening right directly in my muscle cells. Allosteric interactions allow this to happen instantaneously. Once I start making any AMP, I immediately start making this, and I start immediately breaking down glycogen. That's pretty cool. Okay? It means I don't have to wait for adrenaline to kick in, which it will kick in in a minute, and I'll talk about that. On the other side, what's happening? Well, let's imagine that I had some leftover glycogen phosphorylase sitting around that had some phosphate on it. That might happen. What would happen to it? Well, it turns out I almost never have any leftover glycogen phosphorylase in the T state with phosphate on it. Why? Because it automatically turns into the R state. It doesn't take an allosteric effector. It automatically flips from here into here. So if I had any of this sitting around, I wouldn't have any of this sitting around because it would immediately flip into the R state. That means the cell isn't going to leave any of this stuff sitting around. Right? Instead, what's going to happen is, let's imagine that I get up and I go running and I discover, oh, wow, um, there's not a fire. So I come back, I sit down, I eat more pizza, I drink more beer, and I flick more channels on the tube. Right? What's going to happen to my glucose levels? Well, I just dumped a whole bunch of glucose over here, and I'm not burning it up. My glucose levels are rising. When my glucose levels are rising, I'm going to convert this back to here, and we're going to see we're ultimately going to convert it back to here. So when glucose levels go high, I get out of this most active state, go to a less active state, and ultimately back to this state. Now, it's the combination of the allosteric interactions and the covalent modifications that allow our bodies to do the things that they do. Okay? The thing I haven't told you, and I've, I've mentioned it before, but now I'll tell you about it, is adrenaline. Adrenaline's a big player here. What does adrenaline do? Adrenaline activates kinases. Adrenaline activates kinases. So, back over here. When I started this whole thing, I was sitting around eating pizza, drinking beer, watching the tube, and the fire alarm went off. Instantaneously, I did some of this going down to here. And instantaneously, my adrenaline started flowing. And adrenaline's known as epinephrine, by the way. Okay. My adrenaline starts flowing, but I said it takes a few seconds. After a few seconds, it gets to my target cells, being my liver cells. It targets my muscle cells, both of which have glycogen. And it activates their kinases. It doesn't matter if the enzyme is in this state or the enzyme is in this state, either one of these two states will get phosphates and they will go this direction. They'll move to the right. And when this guy moves to the right, what's it going to do? It's going to go down. Adrenaline is going to favor very strong activation of this guy because it's going to put phosphates on there. And that, this guy down here is going to start breaking down glycogen like crazy the glucose levels are going to rise very quickly. This is why a person, when they get scared and they see the baby under the car, they can literally go and lift the car. Literally, I'm not making this up, folks. They can lift the car because their body has dumped so much glucose into their muscles that it's actually, it's actually energetically possible for them to do that. Right? Adrenaline is a pretty remarkable thing. Well, this is playing with fire, folks. 
This is definitely playing with fire. You asked the, somebody up here asked the question earlier, do we ever burn all of our glycogen up? Do we ever break it all down? Well, if we didn't have careful controls on this, we would. Right? Because this is a really powerful enzyme. This enzyme can really do a lot of chewing. We want to control this enzyme. So it's one of the reasons we have elaborate controls on here to turn it on, and as we will see, to turn it off. Okay. Well, we turn it off using this enzyme phosphoprotein phosphatase, but we want to turn it off under controlled conditions just like we wanted to turn it on under controlled conditions. Phosphoprotein phosphatase is activated by insulin. When we eat that giant meal and have that milkshake and we've got all those carbs in our bloodstream, our blood glucose levels go high and that's the last thing that we want because glucose is a poison and the way you get rid of a poison is you take it out of the bloodstream. Okay? Insulin favors the intake of glucose. It also stops the breakdown of glycogen. You don't want your liver dumping out glucose into the bloodstream in the Cori cycle when you've already got plenty of glucose there. So phosphoprotein phosphatase is activated and what it does is it stops the breakdown of glycogen. It's converting this guy from the phosphorylated state into the dephosphorylated state. It's converting this guy into this guy, and if we have plenty of energy, what's going to convert? It's going to go right back up to here. So now we've covered all situations. Now, I'm sparing you guys some details. There's actually quite a few more details than what's here. I know I've given you a lot already. But suffice it to say, that this pathway is reciprocally regulated. Okay? It's reciprocally regulated. When I said reciprocal regulation, what did I mean? Well, with respect to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, when I turn one on, I turn the other one off. And when I turn the other one on, I turn the first one off. Right? I only had one on at a time. This pathway is glycogen breakdown. What would be the corresponding anabolic pathway? Glycogen synthesis, right? The things that cause this pathway to be turned on, the phosphorylation, cause glycogen synthase to be turned off. And yes, epinephrine stimulates them too. So when epinephrine stimulates phosphorylation, it's stimulating phosphorylation not only of glycogen phosphorylase to turn it on, it's stimulating the phosphorylation of glycogen synthase to turn it off. You don't want to have them both going on at the same time because you've got a vicious cycle. Now, when insulin comes along, what is insulin doing again? Insulin is telling the cells Quit releasing your glucose because we're absorbing glucose from the bloodstream. Glucose levels are going high inside the cell. We got to do something with that glucose, right? Because glucose is a poison. You're getting tired of me hearing that, saying that all the time, but that's what it is. You got to deal with that poison. So what do you do with that poison? Well, you take phosphoprotein phosphatase, you turn off synthesis. What do you, I mean, turn, turn off breakdown. What do you suppose it does to synthesis? it turns it on. Glycogen synthase is activated by the removal of the phosphate. And what is glycogen synthase going to do? It's going to take that glucose and it's going to make glycogen, thereby detoxifying it. That's really cool. That's really cool stuff. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. A lot of stuff there, okay? And I'm kind of going over it a little bit quickly. All right? I see heads going like this, right? But that's, that's how this system works. All right? This is why I get excited about metabolism. All right? I can see, wow, this, this regulation that's built into this thing is remarkable, and now I know how my body works. All right? 
We haven't finished how your body works. There's a lot more we'll talk about how your body works. But now you start to see how your body works with respect to sugar. All right? We'll talk about how your body works with respect to the citric acid cycle, the breakdown of fats, the synthesis of fats, and you'll see similar things like we're seeing right here. Right? Any questions about that? Yes? If you're exercising and eating, at the, should I make an exam question out of that? Would you like that? No, no. All right. So if you're exercising and eating at the same time, what do you suppose is going to happen? You're probably going to puke. <laughs> I think there's probably one of the reasons that you would puke is that you would do that. Yes, Julie. It does. It does. So it depends on how much you're exercising, how much you're eating, and so on and so forth. Exactly. So marathoners, for example, as they're running along, will take snacks and eat them while they're, they're eating. They're not going to eat a, th uh, a seven course meal while they're doing that. So, and it does take a little while for the insulin to get started as well. Now, the other thing I'll tell you about this, and it's, it's actually a very good question, um, is that remember I said that enzymes don't have on-off switches. We talk about them having on-off switches, but they really, it's more like dialing a volume up or down. And the same is true of pathways you actually have a little bit of both pathways going on at any given time. Okay. Not much, but you have a little bit. That's actually a good exam question. Now, no, no, not, not what you said, but what I just said. Okay. A little bit of each one going on at the same time. Why do you suppose we would have a little bit of, glyco of glycogen breakdown and glycogen synthesis going on at the same time? Why do you suppose we would have a little bit of glycolysis going on at the same time as we have a little bit of gluconeogenesis going on. It's not just because we don't have on-off switches. There's actually a practical reason why we have those going on. Yes? Different cells require different things, but there's, there's a better reason. Uh, I think you're saying you want to have a jump start for it, and the answer is no. No. Um, actually, that's not quite true either, although there is one thing related to what you said that it's true, and that is that... Um, Cells, uh, bacterial cells commonly will, will have things going on so they can lower their glucose concentrations and bring in more glucose, it makes it more feasible. But that's not the thing I'm looking for here. All right, there you go. All right, we are warm blooded organisms. What do we get from running cycles? Heat. How do we generate heat? From metabolism. Right? All right. Makes sense. <laughs> okay, I'll give you two points for that. How's that? Nobody else got it, so I'll give you two points. So let me know afterwards. All right, you guys have been a good group today. Let's sing a song to celebrate. But this has nothing to do with biochemistry. It has to do with the weather, okay? I have been outside since 8 o'clock this morning at the Celebrating Undergraduate Excellence. It's cold out there. It's rainy out there. And I will tell you what, folks. It was not fun, number one. We've had dry, we've had hot, and all of a sudden the weather has turned on us, so I think we should sing a song. So the forecast says much more raining, it's of this that I'm complaining, I get cranky from all the slop, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop, it is dark and it's gray and gloomy, the climate's out to screw me. I go crazy with drip, drop, drop. Please make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Every time that I look outside and I spot the sun, then I know that our weather is Jekyll Hyde when it goes out and makes a rainbow. So now I know if the rain is dropping that my clothing will be sopping. I don't care if it's good for crops. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Okay. 
see you guys. And I'll get the, the videos posted soon.